Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out your wings. And slither in place. Because this is Snakebird. Snake Bird. Hey, welcome Snakebirds to another episode of the Snakebird Podcast. In today's episode, we're taking time to examine what rightfully could be described as one of the most corrupt and notorious families associated with and woven into the history and pages of Scripture. It's another snakebird profile, but I'm not completely sure we're going to learn any to-dos from their lives as much as we might grab a hold of a ton of to-don'ts. So Stephen, who are we profiling today? Well, today, guys, it is a buy one, get a bunch free. We are profiling the Herods, the Herod family, the Herod dynasty. And to be honest, when I was first thinking about Herod, I was like, I know this guy. He's the, the one that killed the male children when Jesus was born. And then I thought, and he was also the one that killed John the Baptist, and then I started piecing together, wait a minute, timeline, something's not adding up yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And th- 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 there's a, a little bit more to the story. Yeah, it's so <laughs> funny, because now after we've done our study, I'm like, okay, wait, the Herods, a father, sons, daughters, grandchildren, they're all notorious in their own right, but they're also kind of used by God for his purposes. They don't even know it necessarily. True, as it usually goes in scripture. Yeah, but this almost feels like a mob family with all the interwoven ties to the Romans and all their twists and turns of their story. For sure, for sure. It's crazy. It's very much like the mob. And the name Herod, as we're fixing to get into, leads us down a historical road that branches into so many different stories. Your brain will have to work overtime to consolidate it all. But unlike the stories in that branch, we should mention that their family tree does not. Yeah, and studying for this, I found that the Herodians intermarried so much that their family tree looks less like a tree and more like a telephone pole. <laughs> As in, it doesn't branch out much. It really doesn't. And we're hoping you're laughing at that listener <laughs> because, yeah. because it is, it's a twisted little inbred scenario and we're going to get into it. <laughs> well, and, okay, so just honesty here. When we first started discussing profiling the Herod in the Bible, we had this long, confusing discussion about exactly which one we were referring to. Yeah. And uh, we were like, well, well, which one is it? Is it the Jesus one or is it the the Jesus? Like, (laughs) Well, it's only one of two, right? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, No. (laughs) No, not at all. And so I'm I'm pretty happy that we're profiling them. And I, uh, I hope that we can do it in an entertaining style because the more that I found on this, that it actually seems more of like an ancient Roman reality TV show. That that's what their lives amount to. It really does. And like you mentioned earlier, Josh, I think before we started recording, this is almost like a college class. Yes. So we're we're gonna do our best to balance the line of useful information and just so much history. Yeah, and and please do not check out. This is not boring by any stretch of the means. There, <laughs> there are twists and turns. There's backstabbing. There's uh, there's executions. Yeah. There's somebody that dies in a volcano. Uh, there's <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff, and so it's like Dallas meets um, a, a soap opera meets uh, Arrested Development yeah exactly it meets Arrested Development it's like the Sopranos I don't know there's just a ton because um, it's it all started with of course one guy and then next thing you know you have this big corrupt family and you have a lot of backbiting and a lot of intermarrying going on and, and just all kinds of stuff so please if you're kind of on the fence going well that sounds really boring and I already know about Herod in the Bible Trust me, you if, don't. If you don't know this, then you don't. If you haven't taken college level history classes, you don't. Yeah. Excuse me, I've read all of Wikipedia. <laughs> For sure. So hang on to your seats because there's a lot of information here. And I'm I'm excited to get into it. For real, yeah. So let's talk roots. Um, come to find out the Herod family roots trace all the way back to Esau through a people called the Edomites who were a constant enemy of Israel throughout Old Testament history. King David had actually conquered the Edomites, but archaeological evidence points to them somehow regaining their freedom around the 8th century BC. And by the 6th century BC, the Edomites had again lost their sovereignty. So there's a little bit of give and take through history there. But um, an Arabian tribe of people called the Nabataeans 
um, drove many of the Edomites to southern Judea, which makes a lot of sense because as we're going to see here in a minute, the founder of the Herod dynasty is a man named Antipater, who was appointed by Caesar in 47 BC as the procurator, the procurator <laughs> of Judea. And so they were driven to southern Judea, and then that's kind of where some of the stuff starts. But there's even deeper history than that, clashing families and all sorts of stuff. But the number one thing I, I saw right off the bat is they traced all the way back to Esau. And that's interesting. That is, yeah. And I found that they're called Idumean Arabs um, or Edomites. And it's it, basically their ancestors had converted to Judaism. And yet <laughs> here's another people group who the Jews would regard with a considerable amount of suspicion and prejudice because they also called them half Jews. Yeah. <laughs> like the, there was that like the sure. Samaritans and yep. um, the Hellenists. <laughs> they <laughs> they, they kind of give people the stink eye, didn't they? They really did. Yeah. <laughs> and if you think of it in one way, I mean, the possible framework here of wheat among tares almost. Yeah. Um, all the way back to Jacob and Esau, we see that Satan was building his own people to wreak havoc on God's plan. We know that Satan's been doing that from the beginning, but here we see an actual paper trail from Esau through a lineage that grew alongside the lineage of Jesus, both sides preparing for a prophetic showdown, if you will. And so we're going to get into some of that, not saying that all of them were in that category, but a lot of them were. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I found was fascinating is it's almost like every family was looking out for number one. Mm -hmm. Because remember that we've told the story a lot about um, Annas and Caiaphas and kind of how he had his own little piece of the pie there as the high priest and was running his business. I also found that not only did the Herodians come along to try to establish their dynasty, I also found that they were actually clashing with the Hasmonean dynasty. And the only way that I could describe it is in 37 BC, two dynasties went in and one dynasty came out. It was <laughs> it was like the Lakers and the Celtics. I mean, <laughs> well done. Yeah, one one went away and then one started really succeeding here. And and out came the Herods. Yes. Yeah, and the Herodian <laughs> dynasty was like I have been bored and I will survive. <laughs> and it was basically that. It was like my family's going to live on and and um, to put it this way, Herod the Great, which we'll get into, he married one of the Hasmonean princesses, and then he was <laughs> he planned to drown the last male heir to make sure that their dynasty was sunk. What a guy! I, I, I'm sorry the, for the pun; that was terrible. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, he he he's quite a a trophy. So. Yeah, yeah, he he prethinks things for sure. Yeah, in a very evil way. <laughs> exactly, as we will get into. Yeah. Um, so, as previously mentioned, the founder of the Herod dynasty is a man named Antipater, who was appointed by Caesar, like I said, in 47 BC as the prefect of Judea. And a prefect, later known as a procurator, was a regional ruler that Caesar entrusted to collect taxes, settle matters of local Roman law, and they could even command local Roman troops. So this first domino in the Herod dynasty was a wealthy politician in Judea, Antipater, who fathered a child by the name of Herod. We know him, Herod the Great. Yes, and Antipater actually was, um, he was actually good friends, or he was in good standing at least with Julius Caesar. And that Julius Caesar, yeah. et tu, Brute. <laughs> and he oversaw all the public affairs of Judea, and he was, the, like you said, the provincial governor there in Galilee. Yes. And, and it's really his um, good standing with Caesar that allowed Herod the Great's rise to power. Yeah, that's right. And this Herod is the Herod that we see in Matthew 2, 1 and Luke 1, 5. And this is the one that you're going to be familiar with some of the stories related to this Herod. The, yeah. Uh, he heard from the, the traveling Magi about the Messiah who had been born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Um, he wanted to know the exact time that the star appeared so he could, you know, worship him too. <laughs> this, this is that Herod. Yeah. He's trying to, to locate and kill uh, Jesus. So that, that's the Herod that we're, we're talking about here. Well, he says, I'm king of the Jews. And you say that there's a new king of the Jews coming? Exactly. I want to meet him. <laughs> he was, yeah. He was calculating the time frame based on when they, they saw the star and, um, he went on to slaughter every child two years and younger yeah. at that point. Yeah. When you talk about him, he's known as Herod the Great. But every time I come across his name, I go, Herod 
the great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cause he did some pretty awesome things. I mean, there are some pros to his rule and reign, but there are some definite cons. Like you said, um, I've always heard that story. And at first I really thought that he killed a ton of children. Mm-hmm. And I found out that Bethlehem being kind of the smaller uh, city that it might've been, there may not be as many kids that I thought that he'd killed. Oh, but really? no matter, I mean, yeah, I, I was yeah. like, I was considering it to be in the hundreds, but yeah. in that small of a community, it might have been like maybe 12 to 20. He only killed 12 babies. Well, <laughs> that's where, it, <laughs> that's where you're like, you're thinking is like, still one child ripped from their parents' arms and, and killed is terrible. Well, and you know, it, it was enough to cause an enormous amount of pain, enough so that prophecy was given for it. In Jeremiah thirty-one fifteen, it says, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And this is believed by many scholars to be a prophecy of when Herod killed those children. Because uh, Jeremiah 31 is a rich prophetic chapter about the Messiah. And I did find that several scholars believe that to be prophetic of when Herod did that. Mm-hmm. So it, it was an event to be remembered, that's for sure. Yeah. And crazy thing was is that because of him doing that, he actually helped to fulfill prophecy in Hosea 11, 1, yep. because it said, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son because God in warning Joseph and Mary, he said, Hey, rise up and flee to Egypt so you can get out of the rule and reign of this crazy dude. Exactly. And you know, oftentimes I think we read past some of these, the most gruesome stories in scripture because they're so familiar But when we actually stop to think about what that event was like, I mean, that must have been horrendous, especially if you're a parent out there. Imagine your house being stormed in the middle of the night and your toddler being ripped from your arms and butchered in front of you. That's the type of person we're dealing with. Someone so controlled by Satan out of a satanic lineage, if you will, whose ego and greed drove him to basically drunk with bloodlust, so much so that he did that. Mm -hmm. And that that's the type of, of person we're dealing with in Herod the Great, like you said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, um, I found some really interesting things just about him as a whole. So, uh, like we said, he was Idumean in race or Edomite in race. He was a Jew in religion. He was a heathen in practice and a monster in character. Well put. Um, I, it was rumored that he was really short, like he was four foot four inches. So he would have had like an F-250 on really tall tires? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would have. He uh, he was a little man with kind of that big, uh, little big man dog. syndrome. Yeah, exactly. He wanted to be the big dog. Yeah. And it kind of came out that that's how he, that's how he rolled. Yeah. Because he had a rival from, I said the earlier, the Hasmonean um, dynasty. Yeah. He had a rival that was a prince of theirs named Antigonus. Um, I think that's how you say it, who was actually backed by the Parthians. And that was Rome's greatest enemy at the time, because, of course, you know, Rome was just kind of spreading out and taking over anything. And um, so he had this he had this uh, rival with him and he ended up overtaking the kingdom where he was a tetrarch for Hyrcanus number two. So anyway, as he took over Antigonus, he defeated him. And then finally he was like, now I can make my play for power. And he ended up going to Rome and asking, can you make me the king of the Jews? And they said, yes, but you still have to capture Jerusalem. So I, yeah. Yeah, just so much selfish ambition. Yes. It makes me think of James 3, 14 and 16. If you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And I, I can't help but think of that verse because that's precisely what we see in the Herod family. People have caved into such vanity, mm-hmm. such selfish ambition, little man syndrome, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that they, uh, they're the perfect candidates for Satan to utilize. Yes, for sure. And, and like I said, he's not known for all of his things being bad. At times he was actually a decent ruler and in a sense he created jobs because he had a passion 
for magnificent architecture and monuments. And um, he passed that on to his family. And so he mm. made the Jewish people happy by proposing to reconstruct Solomon's temple. Of course, they um, they were excited about that, but they were suspicious of him because they thought that he had an ulterior motive of coming into possession of the public genealogies that were collected at the temple. And the idea was that he wanted to destroy them in an effort to make sure that the expected Messiah couldn't come and usurp his kingdom. Yes. So this whole like, oh, the king of the Jews is here? What? Exactly. That I find that so interesting because um, it's recorded those Jewish leaders actually used to say whoever has not seen Herod's building has not seen anything built, uh, beautiful. Mm. And he was known to be quite the architect, and he did that for the Jews. And the eerie thing about that situation, when you, when you think about it, like you just mentioned— um, there's this, and I keep mentioning this because I find it fascinating. We have this this lineage from Esau who's been molded in the way of Satan, and at this point, he's already heard of the born Messiah and is plotting to kill him. And what are they doing? Herod is beautifying their temple in order to work the Jewish leaders into a place so that the next thirty years they could be seduced into the type of people that would slaughter their own Messiah. Oh, wow. And he's doing that with flattery. I'm beautifying your temple, yeah. and they're loving him for it. Yeah, he's molding their their minds already 30 years prior mm -hmm. to Jesus ministry. So yeah, I find that I do find that very interesting. Yeah. I mean, for him, I, I think again, it was always that underlying um, thing about his rule and reign. Like he really always wanted to secure that. Mm -hmm. and, and of course he had some other projects that I thought were really neat, maybe of, of just um, of note. Like he did uh, the port in Caesarea, which became part of church history because that's where Paul ended up um, witnessing before his grandson. And, and that's where Pilate ended up having his summer home. It was where he really chose to, to hang out. It was a really beautiful place. And then he had another place called the tomb of the patriarchs. He had a fortress at Masada. And then I really liked this place and I always thought it was interesting. And if you get a chance to Google it, you should, because it's called Herodium and it means mountain of the little paradise. And apparently Herod was so paranoid that he would build these fortresses that if anything ever happened that he and his family could flee to and it's just this little hill that's kind of has like just this fortress and these caves built into it and it's the spot where he defeated Antigonus his rival and of course it made me think of I have the high ground Anakin you know <laughs> <'Cause>, yeah <laughs> uh, and so he just it's it's one of those things where if I ever get to go to Israel it's one of the places I definitely want to visit just because it looks so neat and if you say that at that time having the high ground gave you more of a defense which they say it did yeah he really had this really neat fortress that would have withstood some attacks no kidding he was, yeah, he had he had a real talent for for building and and architecture from what I read. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. Yeah. So it's so interesting because when you hear about Mark Anthony or Cleopatra or Julius Caesar, sometimes I just only associate that to the the story I've heard from Shakespeare about Caesar. Mm -hmm. But these are real people that were happening during this time. And I found out that two of the threats to Hera's rule were, number one, Alexandra, who was part of that Hasmonean dynasty, was actually trying to get in with um, Cleopatra. And in a tasty power move, they were trying to have Aristobulus appointed as the high priest as a way to get back into power. But of course, Herod had him assassinated. <laughs> and so then of course he did. Uh, Anthony and Octavian, and then of course, Octavian later becomes Augustus, uh, squared off. And at first, Herod had pledged his fealty to Anthony, but he chose the wrong horse in the race. And in order to regain Octavian Augustus, the, the Caesar Augustus, basically, his trust, it was through money and military defense and basically proving his uh, worth and royalty. Um, one article that I read even said that he came to Rome and he laid prostrate before him and just was like, I am your servant. Because yeah. one of the biggest things that you can tell through his whole rule and reign was he was always paranoid about losing his position. That that was why he was so um, skeptical about the, the wise men coming and saying, hey, we saw this star in the sky. Where is the man who's meant to be ruler? And he's like, I, you found me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the one of the most obvious things as you look into Herod the Great is his ego. 
He is constantly trying to think two steps ahead of how he can further himself and how he's willing to step on anybody to get there. Yeah. Including killing his own family. Yeah. Speaking of that. So he married, like I said, into the Hasmonean dynasty. He married their princess, Miriam, and he had a few kids with her. But um, basically, he had her killed on a charge of conspiracy in 30 B.C. (laughs) <laughs> and not only did he have her killed, but he also had her kids killed. Uh, he had a kid named uh, Aristobulus, um, who was his son. And he really even wasn't uh, raised around Herod. He was actually raised more around Imperial Rome. And his dad got word that maybe he was being disloyal. And the next thing you know, Herod, because of his paranoia, is like, Uh, I want him to die by uh, execution, by strangulation. And he killed him and his brother. But then he also killed, like I said, his wife, Miriam, and her mother. (laughs) Go ahead and throw the mother-in-law in in there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a, what an egomaniac. Yes. He was so, he was always, always looking out for, for himself, no matter the cost, even, even murdering his own family. Did you know that he had a secret police that monitored and reported the opinion of the people to him. They were just spread out through the city. And then he had over 2,000 soldiers as bodyguards at any given time. Wow. That just walked with him. And he was so paranoid that at one point, Augustus claimed that it was safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. That's what he'd seen. And because he killed another son named Antipater, Mm -hmm. who was named after his grandfather. Yeah. And so um, he was uh, he was killed just because um, he actually had uh, (laughs) he had plotted the murder of his father. (laughs) Crazy. Yeah, because he saw what his dad did. And so he was like, well, I'm going to kill him before he kills me. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? And so Herod had him executed as well. Now, here's where it gets weird is that he actually married another woman named Miriam. So he had two Not wives. Not the same Miriam. No. He, well, he had the first one killed. So yes. He married a second oh, one. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 I, I got you now. <laughs> that, that, for some reason, that reminds me of Parks and Rec where uh, Ron Swanson has the Tammies. <laughs> Is it Tammy 1 or Tammy 2? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's funny. That Well, it's not funny, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so William Barclay, a uh, church historian, reminds us what a bloody violent ruler he was. It said he had no sooner come into the throne that he began annihilating the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish religious ruling board. And then he slaughtered 300 court officers. He murdered his wife, Miriam, and her mother, Alexandra, his eldest son, Antipater, and his other two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. And so, I mean, just this this dude. Then there's even one more story that tops that. Yeah. So um, he did die an excruciatingly painful death. And I, I can only think that this may be God visiting some judgment upon him. It was a putrefying illness known only as Herod's evil. And he even tried to commit suicide because he was in such agony. And he was stopped by his cousin. Um, some later accounts say that he eventually succeeded. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say a fitting death, but man, he he did so much evil. And as you were describing all that with him, I couldn't help but think of so many other rulers in history that they become monsters once they get to a certain point yeah. if their heart has been molded by Satan. Yes. I think of Hitler. Yeah. So it reminded me a lot of, of what I've studied in him and even some medieval kings and... Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, man, he was a really evil guy. Well, it's it's like he almost started as, as not great, but the further that he went, the, the stronger the grip of maybe the devil or some influence over him got yeah. to where he was just jealous and paranoid and uh, raged at all times, like violently raged. Well, and you, you know, you talk about the nature and nurture, and I think, I think that a lot of it had to do with the fact of, like you said, what he saw in his parents. Yeah. And if you've been raised in a certain climate, at some point, I believe God gives us all the the choices to to break the chain. But I they that whole lineage has always been a certain mindset mm-hmm. from from what I, I was looking into. And it's man, it's just it was very evil. It came from that kill or be killed vibe. Yeah, yeah. And he leaned into it. Yeah, absolutely. He yeah. sure did. 
So that was the majority of Herod in a nutshell. He's he's known for a lot of things, though. Yeah, and one last thing is his most infamous crime was actually when he was on his deathbed. Uh, he commanded that all the principal men of the entire Jewish nation, um, so another person said like at least 100, should come into his presence. And he was like, hey, guys, come on. And, and I don't know if they thought, oh, are we going to get an award? Or maybe he's going to bestow some kind of... Um, bequeathment as he's passing oh no he he had them all locked up and he had soldiers surround them and he said he gave an order that on my death uh which was to be soon they should all be killed that it might seemingly at least afford the honor of a memorable morning at my funeral unbelievable (laughs) yeah he said all these men who have a high standing in the jewish nation the moment i croak kill them because he wanted to, there to be mourning the day that he died. Yeah, he wanted the whole city sad. And I think he knew that they wouldn't be sad. Yeah. And that's why, precisely yeah. why he did that. And so he died, but fortunately, that order was never carried out. Yeah, but but the very thought that he wanted it to, man. <laughs> what, an, what an egomaniac. Yeah. And what a nutball. Yeah, for real. <laughs> the guy was insane. Yeah, that's, that's my technical term. <laughs> nutball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody said he attained his kingdom as a fox, ruled as a tiger, and died as a dog mm. because he tried to balance being a Jew to the Jews by rebuilding the temple, marrying into the royal family, and then he also tried to be a Roman to the Romans. And he attempted to conform the Jewish people to the Roman customs, and we all know how that goes. And just just to, to clarify the way that was worded, that's not the same type of I'm a Jew to the Jews and Roman to the Roman that Paul's talking no, about. No, yeah. This is driven strictly by selfish ambition. It was only to please the certain people and, and again, rise more and more in power. Yes. Um, but what he ended up doing was he ultimately planted seeds of unrest, which would, 70 years uh, down the road, lead to that Jewish-Roman rebellion. Yeah. So and and like you said at the beginning, a lot of this stuff is actually guiding prophecy. So yeah. I mean, even though he was evil, God he God foresees so much and he orchestrates accordingly. It's, yeah, it's fascinating to see. And one other note is that he was married nine or ten times, which means that he had a ton of kids, and that's why we have more to talk about uh, within the Herodian dynasty. So who should we talk about next, Stephen? Um, let's go Herod. Archelaus? Archelaus? Archelaus. Yeah. Well, because we're already three down. We lost uh, Antipater, we lost Aristobulus, and then we lost Alexander, all put to death. So Herod Archelaus, I, I think, I think that's a good way to say it. Yeah. Uh, he was an ethnarch. An ethnarch. Uh, yeah. A leader of an ethnic group or the governor of a district. And he's the next one mentioned in scripture. He's mentioned in Matthew 2, 23. Because um, when Herod said, hey, I'm going to kill all the babies two years old or under, God sent Mary, Joseph, and Jesus to Egypt. And now God said, return. And as they're coming back, they're coming back and they're going to settle back where they were. They're going to settle in Bethlehem, right? Yes, that's right. And um, Herod, this Herod is only mentioned one time in Scripture in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 2. And while he doesn't get much page time in Scripture, he does have some interesting history and context tied to him. Um, Remember, these Herods, Antipas, Archelaus, and we'll get to Philip, um, these are three uh, of the Tetrarchs. One of them had a double portion, I believe, Josh. Yeah, at first, Archelaus did. Yeah, and so they were reigning over different regions simultaneously, were they not, Josh? Yeah, yeah, well, what, uh, what happened was after Herod the Great died, he actually had it in his will for Antipas to be like his king, but Caesar looked at it and was like, no. Oh, we're good. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't really trust him, and so he said, "Why don't we split it up?" And and so they got split up into four areas, but Archelaus got two of them. Okay, cool. So he reigned in the region of Judea, Samaria, and Udemea. Udemea. Udemey. Udemey. I do may. <laughs> yes, from 4 BC to 6 AD. And this is a much shorter reign than his brother Antipas in um, Galilee and Perea. So it, a lot shorter. And to gather the context here, Josh mentioned it a little bit already. Mary and Joseph fled from Herod the Great when Jesus was a baby, fulfilling that prophecy in Hosea 11, 1, being called from Egypt, and then also that Jeremiah 31 with the uh, toddlers that got killed. And then 
when they were called back to return with Jesus back to Israel, uh, they arrived and quickly noticed that they were not going to be safe there because Herod Archelaus, being the governor of Judea, he was really a chip off the old block. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a very dangerous environment for the Jews. Uh, aside from Joseph being warned in a dream about this, it's also recorded by historian Josephus that Archelaus had placed an offensive Roman eagle over the temple gate. And when two Jewish rabbis instructed their disciples to tear the eagle down, he had them both executed. Mm-hmm. So perhaps Joseph saw this hatred for the Jews in the region, and that, coupled with the dream, urged him to take Mary and Jesus to settle in Nazareth. Nazareth. Mm-hmm. So uh, eventually Herod Archelaus was removed by Rome in 6 AD because, I mean, this type of behavior to the Jews just breeds an atmosphere of, of rebellion and Rome didn't want constant problems from that region, even though they'll always have it. <laughs> yeah. So the things that I found almost sound funny because it says, this son of Herod proved to be such an incompetent and violent ruler that the Jews kept going back to the Romans and saying, hey, can you just do something, anything? And they ended up not even bringing in the same type of ruler. They said, you know what, we're going to do away with this position and we're just going to give you a governor instead. Yeah. And they brought in a guy like Pilate now. Yeah, uh, and, which is precisely precisely why they had procurators in that time instead of a Herod Yes, was because he got booted out. Exactly. And it was said that he was as cruel as his father, but without any of the greatness, <laughs> which <laughs> wow. as much as we know about um, Herod, the great, it, not that great. Yeah. Josephus uh, labeled him as this, a man of kindred nature, suspicion, truculent, which I love that word, to be feared and avoided by such had cause to fear his father. So it's like, if you thought his father should be feared, then you definitely need to look out for the son. And he ended up getting exiled to Gaul, which kind of seems to be a popular destination for all the Herods that get booted out of their roles. Because <laughs> we'll see another one get uh, get booted there as well. Yeah, so not, not a, a very long reign, and he got booted out pretty quick. Yeah, Archelaus. Archelaus. Yeah, don't want to miss him. All right, who's the next one, Josh? Okay, one of our favorites, drum roll. <laughs> uh, it's Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas. And also known as a Tetrarch. Yes. And so <laughs> this dude had issues. Even though daddy was only four foot four, he felt like he had big shoes to fill. And boy, did he not measure up. Uh, <laughs> he was not as good of a ruler as his father. He was called a wily sneak. And his administration was characterized throughout with cunning and crime. Um, he's not, like I said, at the end of Herod's life, uh, he had been named the sole benefactor of the kingship of Herod, but he was not trusted enough by Caesar Augustus to receive the title of king, and he was given instead the title of Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. And, and it's really neat that we can even see in history that there's a coin out there that that actually confirms this. And so I love when we talked about, is the Bible real? you know, can the Bible be trusted? There are historical things that tie into all of this that go, oh yeah, this were, these were real events and Jesus was a real person. So yeah, um, he was first married to a woman named Phasaelus. And then we'll see that he's going to actually get a secondary wife because he um, has some interactions first with Jesus. And then he has some interactions with John the Baptist. And so I'm just going to go with the Jesus one, if that's okay. Uh, it's in Luke 13, and it says, At the time, some Pharisees said to him, Get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. And there is some mixed feelings by commentators about, were the Pharisees really concerned about Jesus, or were they just really tired of him and they wanted him to leave? Yeah. Uh, that was more of the consensus that I found it was leaning towards, was they were just like, Oh, by the way, somebody's looking to kill you, so you need to run. <laughs> and he, yeah. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says... Go tell that fox, I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will accomplish my purpose. Yes, today and tomorrow and the next day, I must proceed on my way. For it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except here in Jerusalem. Yeah. And this this is an interesting scene right off the bat because 
The Pharisees come to Jesus acting like they're worried about him, saying, oh, Herod's going to kill you, Jesus. Oh, no. (laughs) And it's almost a flavor of like when a gossip comes running to you with some juicy information about someone else, and they're making it sound like they're concerned about them, Mm -hmm. but they're just really wanting to spread gossip. Exactly. And that's, that's what the Pharisees are doing. And don't forget, the majority of these Pharisees are already corrupt in cahoots with Herod's, with all the Herod's, because Herod started that flattery with the beautifying of the temple, and Jesus even... Even speaks of this union between the two in Mark 8 15 he says and he was given orders to them saying watch out beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod Ooh. so Jesus almost marries the two groups um, right you know warning people that they they're kind of the same so yeah it's it's a it's a very it's an intense scene it reminds me of two siblings like when one sibling is hanging out and they don't want the other sibling around and they're like mom said you need to go home right now yeah. <laughs> and you're like what she didn't tell me yeah and they're like you need to leave herod's coming for you and he's like but i love what jesus says is he says go tell that fox mm-hmm. and and i found this website and it was probably more research than i needed to do but it was like let's find out what the meaning of fox meant for that day and they were doing all this word study and they were talking about what fox could mean throughout history and they're like this is what it meant for a greek person to say fox during jesus's time frame what jesus was trying to say through calling him a fox was he was saying tell that small fry that insignificant person that peon that pompous pretender that i'm not afraid of him at all in fact if if he was looking for me he, he's not going to succeed because God has a purpose. And anyway, it was just like everybody went, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he just said that. A direct statement. <laughs> yes. It, yeah. It, it's, 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 it's close to being like Jesus when he called out the, the Pharisees. A lot of people were like, man, he just threw a ton of shade. I mean, this was him throwing some serious shade in the direction of Herod, uh, the Tetrarch, not the king. Yes. Yeah, it for sure was. And though we've already established him for the most part, a lot of it, um, there's so much information. Yeah. But um, Herod Antipas is the Herod that we see in Matthew 14 and Luke 3. He's the one who, um, like Josh says, he acquired another wife, that of his brother Philip, named Herodias. Yes. So Herod and now Herodias. That's like a, a Billy and a Billy, or a, a Clyde and a Clydeine, you know. A Lynn and a Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, well, let's just say if it was Josh, it'd be Josh and Josephine. Yeah. Or Stephen or, and Stephanie. Yeah, which... They sound a little different. They do, but in this case, it's weird. It is weird. because Yeah, yeah. So this affair, it was apparently quite the gossip around town because everyone seemed to know about it, so much so that we've all probably heard the story of John the Baptist who spoke publicly against the affair, and this made deadly enemies out of Herodias. Uh, The story is found um, in Matthew 14, starting in verse 1, and also in Mark 6, starting in verse 14. But as it goes, um, basically... John publicly condemned this affair, and Herodias developed a hatred for him. There's a reason the old saying says, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. That's what we see in Herodias right here. And she felt the public shame, and the the grudge started to to really intensify towards John. Yeah, so Herod, too, uh, Herodias' original husband, he had... Who also is known as Herod Philip. Yes. Right. Yes, he had Herod Antipas staying at his house. And since he was staying at his house, Herod Antipas and Herodias were living together. And they felt, you know, it was maybe they were sitting out by the pool and they started making eyes at each other, but they're technically cousins. Yeah. <laughs> and there's that family tree telephone pole thing. Yeah. And they fell in love and they, they eloped together, but they were both married at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was why it was such a big thing. And that's why John the Baptist. Once he got a hold of this, he wouldn't let it go because he's like, you are the rulers of the people. You're supposed to be Jews and you're supposed to be giving a good example, but instead you're living in sin and he wouldn't let it go. And of course it did not sit well with her. No, not at all. And the interesting thing about this dilemma is that while Herodias wanted to kill John for this because of this, this steamy grudge, 
Herod did not. I mean, I'm sure Herod didn't like being scorned in public by John, for sure. But in Mark 6, verse 20, it says, For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. So we have Herod actually protecting John, partly because he feared a revolt from John's disciples if he harmed him, but also he was intrigued by his teaching. And although we've talked about it many times before, I would have to mention again that this is another example of one who is intrigued by the gospel, even moved by the gospel, but refuses to embrace the gospel. It's a dangerous place to find yourself in. Exactly, yeah. And and just John the Baptist kept going, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Yes. And eventually Herod arrests him. He does. And that leads us to the scene where Herodias conspires this plan in which she uses her own daughter, Herod's niece, to do what I can only imagine to be an exotic dancer routine. At which point, Herod, being the stand-up guy that he says, says, wow, what a fantastic, provocative dance my little niece just did. (laughs) And Herod, you know, being so impressed with his cheeky little dance that he promises his niece anything she wants in front of all the nobility at the party. Yeah, They're all there, and he's, uh, you know, aroused with excitement and just says, you know what, I'll give you anything. Yeah. Just impulsive promise. Yeah, I mean, he regretted being led by his passions and horned up by his stepdaughter. Yeah. And said, you can have up to half my kingdom. Yeah. And much to his surprise, after consulting with her mother, Herod's niece came back to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That's when her trap sprung. Yeah. And and we see in Matthew 14 and Mark 6 that Herod became haunted with paranoia after this event because he knew it was a major mistake. And that that's where Jesus calls him, you know, that fox. Yeah. Where Jesus responds. Yeah. I found this from Trap, just talking about Herodias. It said, she ruled him at her pleasure as Jezebel did Ahab, but it never goes well when the hen crows. (laughs) Because she literally was just in his ear going, hey, 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 I I don't like this dude calling out my sin. And and that was something about it is she was like, I don't want anyone revealing what I've done. And she wasn't going to let it go. Yeah. And so it's a terrible scene. Yes. You know, uh, we've been talking for about Herod's for a little while now, and I think we have several more to go. In fact, we're not even done with Herod Antipas. So we're going to leave this here on a cliffhanger. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. All um, right. Unfortunate so, for you, the listener. I'm sorry, but it has to be done. I hope this time, just even talking about Herod the Great and then the five people that he killed and then uh, Archelaus and Antipas has been awesome because, again, it's gone so fast for us. Yeah, perhaps a history lesson we know because we, yeah. it, it took up our time this week studying for it but <laughs> man it's uh, there's a lot of information here but I know for me I walked away with a lot more understanding of what was going on in the time of Jesus in the the climate the culture what people were thinking with these rulers in place and how they got maneuvered so yeah we hope that it's a good place for you to come back as an arsenal if you're ever needing that historical context yes because I've said this before and I'll say it again I don't know how this hasn't been made into a TV series or a movie because there is so much more. And and even just looking at my notes, there's so much more to come even in the next 10 minutes of the first episode. Yeah, no kidding. Come back for the rest of it because it, it gets even more interesting. Exactly. So with that as our outro, uh, don't forget to share, subscribe, um, anything that you can do, comment, leave a review. That'd be awesome. That's right, guys. So don't forget, guys, that one great way to help us is to give us a rating, a review. If you can do that, find the time. It pushes us out with algorithms, and uh, as we say, it's not about numbers, it's about the gospel. So if you could find time to do that, we would deeply appreciate it. And if you feel like, man, this was the most boring thing I've ever heard, or this was really intriguing, we'd love to hear from you. And so connect with us and let us know, because if it was really boring, then we, we're sorry. Yeah. And uh, we'll try to stray away from doing stuff like this in the future, even though we'll still talk about historical, biblical characters, maybe just not go as much into their backgrounds. But um, if you're liking this, then we want to double down and kind of dive into some of these things. I'll never forget the day where I was like, we should talk about the Herods, because <laughs> that changed the course of my weeks for ever for real so yeah we definitely want your feedback reach out to us yeah so that's part one always remember whatever you do wherever you go no matter what life throws at you there's never been a better time to follow the words of jesus and be a snake snake bird. bird